and welcome back to Kapow for a brand new year. I'm Sonia. And I'm Al. It is exciting to be back kicking off 2016 with so many new things mm -hmm. on the horizon, but some things remain the same. We are still here at King's Comics. And there are still heaps of awesome comics to review. Starting off with a few issue ones that recently hit the shelves. Surviving Megalopolis, Spirit Leaves, and Gutter Magic. We'll also be looking at an anthology collection from Humanoids Publishing called The Tipping Point. Ray and I will be looking at a rogue statue by Kotobukiya. And Jill will be with us as usual to chat with me about the TV series iZombie. So why not slip into your comfy pants and put your feet up? Why am I never allowed to wear my comfy pants for this? Because you have that hole in them and you scare people. In a reality where the definitive blow of World War II was struck using magic rather than an atom bomb, the world might have ended up quite differently from the one that we know, and those differences might not all be for the better. In the pages of Gutter Magic, written by Rich Duick with art by Brett Barkley, we are introduced to Cinder Burns, a young ne'er-do-well desperate to gain true magic, the one thing preventing him from joining the sorceress elite, and he's willing to beg, borrow or steal to achieve his goal. Well. Mostly just steel. There's a lot of cool elements hmm. to this story, not least of all a sneak thief with a goblin partner and a magic gun. <laughs> what did you think of this one, Sons? Well, I really enjoyed this one. I'm going to give it a buy. I think Gutter Magic has got a really interesting premise, you know, marrying those real world events like World War II with the idea of magic and sorcery. And sure. I think that's quite a cool kind of way to get into this world. It's hmm. something that I don't think I've come across, which is kind of awesome. Yeah. Uh, the art in it is really cool. It's bombastic, it's colourful, there's a lot of movement, there's a lot of action in there, but the pace is actually really well done. There's not so much crazy, 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 and then it's just a really nice blended pace. And sure. also there's a great character kind of introduced at the end there, which mm. is a really good hook at the end of this first issue to get you to get to that next one. I think the morgue Great name yes. for a character, Great by the way. Great name for a bad guy. The yeah. morgue. If is she gonna... does turn out to be a bad no, guy, we, we don't, don't know. know. Yeah. But I think that's a really cool kind of concept, and the way that she's introduced in this first issue is is really cool. I, mm. yeah, I really enjoyed it. It's a, just a fun fantasy kind of read, out. Huh? Okay, well, I'm going to give it a borrow oh. personally. Um, I did like it. I did enjoy it. I think the premise is certainly very yeah, solid, as you say. Very cool. It um, really tackles things in an interesting way, even creating a sort of a classist society yep. based on who has magic. Things yep. like that. That was all great. What dropped it down a little bit for me was, frankly, the the central characters. Yeah, right. Just didn't seem to have much depth to me. Okay. Um, seemed to be basically kind of cookie cutter a little bit. You know, <laughs> our, our lead character Cinder Burns. Nice little pun. That's an excellent name. name. There. What? Um, but he just <laughs> seemed your standard sort of. I am a lovable rogue, and that we've seen that so many times before. Give me something about this guy <laughs> that's going to give him a bit of texture. Um, and his, you know, his kind of shady partner as well. His goblin Again, friend. Very by the numbers, you know. If, I kind of liked him. In real world, he'd probably be a cockney. You know, it just. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That kind of pulled it back for me a bit, which is a shame because I liked so much of what the rest of this comic is doing. Certainly it looks great. Yeah, um, the characters look amazing. Like sure. the goblin does look pretty cool and the imps and everything. They do look really, yeah. really cool. Absolutely. The character models are really solid. Yeah. And there's certainly some real good work in terms of the world creation as yeah. well. Uh, there's one double page spread in the goblin market. Yeah. It's, it's like an Escher painting. <laughs> it's very cool. It's very cool. Really sort of <laughs> twisty, turny, really very fully realised world. Absolutely. Which I thought, you know, all over they did a very good job at yeah. uh, creating some worlds with this. Yep. Yeah. Um, so, look, I'm hoping as it goes forward, maybe it'll surprise me. Maybe these characters will throw something out that I'm not expecting. Maybe it's more of a trade read for you. Then. Sure, yeah, no, so I definitely will check it out once it's gone to its full run. Cool, well, moving on, we come to a comic that asks the not unprecedented question, what if a superhero goes bad? <laughs> but it takes it to an extreme of what if an entire city's worth of superheroes go bad? Leaving Megalopolis was a Kickstarter-funded miniseries created by Gail Simone and Jim Calafiore. Surviving Megalopolis revisits the survivors of the first miniseries, not just the former heroes still quarantined within the city, but also the few regular humans who managed to escape, and who may now have to go back. So some people may not have read the first series, so do you think this is going to be a good jumping off point for them, or maybe not so much? Well, I guess um, I'd say yes and no. Uh, it's hard for me to say, honestly, because I have read the first one, sure. so I think it was uh, quite a rich experience for me yep. seeing these characters return. Um, but on the other hand, I think Gal Simone does a great job of putting enough information up top yep. that you're not going to feel left at sea if you haven't read the first one. Sure. 
Although I think it is going to make you want to read <laughs> the first series as soon as you start reading this. That's it what is... you can do when you're waiting for issue number two to come out. Absolutely, yeah. <laughs> that, that's what it'll make you want to do. And it's well worth doing. This is, as you said, this is a question that's been asked before. The mm -hmm. superhero's gone bad. But it's done in a really interesting and darkly psychological way. Yeah. Uh, that I don't think, I, you know, you feel quite challenged about the whole concept. It's yep. not just a simple flipping of the switch. It's its dark in a way that I don't think I've seen since uh, maybe a god somewhere. Yeah, It would have been absolutely. a similar sort yep. of area of psychology to of thing, it. Yep. Um, the superheroes turned bad are fantastic mm. in terms of their visuals. I love the variety that they've got of these these bad superheroes. <laughs> um, I read uh, Califiori actually started sort of backwards engineered from their destroyed outfit. Awesome. Once they've gone evil and, you know, they've got a dead person's handprint on their chest and broken visor and all this sort of stuff. <laughs> and then he worked backwards to see what their original In their shining, outfit would have looked like. Version, yeah. And I th there's just so much thought that's gone into this. And yep. that's why it's such a deep, rich experience. Mm. Um, and it is probably more about the regular humans than it is about the heroes. Absolutely. Um, which I know Simona said that regular people are so much harder to write than heroes <laughs> uh, because they have to be more believable. They there, there isn't the shorthand that you have yep. for superheroes. So I think it's a fantastic experience. I mean, yeah. what did you think? Well, look, I am one of those people that haven't read the first series. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, I dug it. I really yep. enjoyed this. It's a buy from me as well. I think that uh, um, Simone's put in enough exposition and enough kind of flashbacks that you get a sense of the first series sure. well enough that you're like, yep, I'm here. And you you just get thrown headlong into this story, which mm. is, or I like that kind of, yeah. ah, well, ah, even, what's even, happening, what's happening? Even it's the very first cool. miniseries was actually after things are dropped. Exactly, yeah. So it's, you know, you're not actually doing anything particularly different with no. the second one. And so I, I think it was a really, and it's such a well-paced um, issue as well. Sure. It really, it pulls you into this story. It introduces these characters. It gives you the crisis and it's like, right, and we're off, we're yeah. running. And the art, I have to say, Califiore has done a beautiful job marrying yeah. such a brutal and kind of ugly art. Yeah. But it's still What's really this destroyed beautiful. City? You see the superheroes standing there at the end of this broken bridge, and even though they're all messed up and they're all, you know, they're, they're behaving in a very unsuperhero kind of way, yeah. you do actually see what they would have been in their former glory. You Absolutely. kind of, it really does shine well, through. Well, you see them as the city as well, you know, they're yeah. reflected in the destruction of this city. Absolutely. Hmm. It just, it's a really beautiful, and it's quite a bombastic art style, which yeah. really married so well with Simone's story. So mm. I love this one. I'm definitely going back to read the other, the first series. Excellent. <laughs> now, as we all know, practically every good fairy tale starts the same way, with a foolish young hero striding off into the wilderness to get themselves into all manner of trouble. In issue one of Spirit Leaves by Rossi Gifford, our foolish young hero is Freya an albino deer girl who heads out on her own to stop a demon and to restore balance to the forest. Along the way, she meets a wolf boy named Skull, who's hunting the demon to prove himself to his pack. Gifford eschews traditional framing and creates a fascinating visual feast. Yeah, the compositions are really interesting. Yeah. The art style sort of made me feel like it's halfway between uh, Charles Vess and Paul Pope, <laughs> yeah, which yeah, is not a bad place to yep. be. I'm guessing you enjoyed this one. I absolutely loved this issue. Mm. It's definitely a big buy from me. The art is absolutely what drew me in. Yep. Bit of Charles Vest, bit of Paul Pope. It's also a little bit Studio Ghibli to me. I can like see that. it's that kind of mythic fairy tale, gentle kind of story, which mm. I really, really loved. And there's some amazing perspectives that are being put through this, some beautiful action that you, you really get drawn along with. And I love the fact that, yeah, there is no panelling in this. Yeah. There are no panels, it just kind of moves through the page, but you're never at loss at where to, to follow the uh, Freya and Skull. Yep. The story moves through so beautifully that, I don't know, the art just, oh, it's just beautiful. <laughs> yeah. The story, though, the story is a very simple story, but it's in no means a simplistic story. You know, it's about identity and proving oneself to your your, your clan or to your pack. And, hmm. and there's a little bit of um, environmental kind of awareness in there as well. Yeah. Well, I think it is, is very sort of cool. a, it's a coming of age story. It is, way. yeah. yeah. So. And it's, you know, Freya and Skull are really interesting characters because they are from the two very different, you know, Skull is a wolf boy, he's a pack uh, mentality, he's a bit more brutal than what Freya is. Freya mm. is a deer girl, she's the shaman, she wants to, you know, find the demon and prove herself that she can be that, that shaman and, yeah. and be that person that she really, really desperately wants to be. And I think it's one of those stories that would be really nice to share with a younger audience. Sure. 
Um, I think it's one that, you know, you could really sit down with, with your, you know, your brothers and your sisters or nieces and nephews and go through this story, go through this journey with Freya and Skull and I, I think they'd really enjoy it. I just love it. The art, the art, the art, the art, the art. Just buy it for that. Like, hmm. honestly, it's beautiful. Al, d say you liked it. Yeah, no, I did like okay, it. Okay, good. I did, I did like <laughs> it. Um, I, I think it's, it's a buy from me as well. Good. Uh, I think it's a lovely piece of work. What's interesting uh, to me about this is that Gifford is not a creator who's been in the industry. Nope. Uh, for some time. Uh, she actually created uh, Spirit Leaves as a graduating project for a diploma in art yeah. college um, and it became available in local comic shops. It's not until recently uh, that it's actually been available overseas. Mm, which is great. Um, so that's fantastic. Yeah. I think it's, it's great to see a new talent. Maybe it's, it's new people that do take things in these different directions. Yeah. As you say, the lack of panelling, the interesting compositions, yep. the sort of the flowing way that the <sighs> art works in here, so uh, all works really, really well. It's very engaging mm. and, and very uh, very interesting for the eye. It's, it's something we don't see a lot of. No. Uh, the story is a simple one, uh, but I don't think that's necessarily a bad thing at all. It's a classic fairy tale concept. Yeah. It's that coming of age, it's that foolish young creature going out into the world, <laughs> getting into trouble and learning good lessons. Absolutely. Um, as you say, there's there's that environmentalist concept there as well. Yep. So there's a lot of great stuff there. Great for a younger audience being brought in with a simple story, yep. but I think it's the artwork that's going to drag in your adult audiences, <laughs> case in point, yes. um, and I think they're going to appreciate it as well. It's uh, certainly well worth having a look at, and yep. I think it's, it's only going to grow with time. Yeah, awesome. So that's just a couple of uh, titles that we've looked at. We'd love to know what you're reading. Let us know in the comments on Facebook or on Twitter. Hey Ray. Hey Sonia, hey everyone. So this piece is rather striking. It is, isn't it? This is the Rogue Danger Room Sessions figure, yet another addition to the Kotobukiya fine art statues. Based on a concept from the artistic pair Manuel and Leo Silva, Rogue embodies both power and beauty. The spirited mutant is posed dynamically flying in the air with one foot barely resting on the smashed hand of her previous opponent. This is a sixth scale figure sculpted by Eric Souza. I love the classic costume. It's beautifully created with a vibrant green and yellow bodysuit and the brown jacket. I'm not sure I like the head sculpt though. I know she's cheeky, but I can't tell if she's enjoying the challenge or just indifferent. Well, lucky you can change it. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah, she comes with a switch out head for alternate display, this time with the classic hair. I much prefer this expression and the detail of her curly hair. It adds more to the overall image. Yeah, I agree. There's much more of her character present, but my favourite part is the base. The gnarled, battle-damaged hand is perfectly articulated. I love some of the smaller details. The three sharp strikes on his finger suggest that Wolverine has had a slice. The crack in the hand blaster looks great, and that Rogue carries the tip of the missing finger in her hand as a trophy or potential weapon. All that's missing is a light, no? Well, it's funny you should say that, because when I was researching the piece, uh, it was supposed to come with an LED light. It's even advertised on the Kotobukiya website, and when I saw that it didn't have one, I was really disappointed, because <laughs> I thought it would be a nice little extra for yep. this, you know, piece overall. Uh, do you think that's a deal breaker? Is that a deal breaker for you? Honestly, it's not for me. No. I'm a big fan of Rogue, so I'm going to give this one a buy. I think she looks fantastic even without the light. She does. Yeah. But right? no, look, for me, <laughs> I'm going to I'm going to have to give her a borrow oh. because I just wanted that little bit extra from her and I was really disappointed at having to, you know, discover something that's advertised and it's not actually there. <laughs> Plus, I do have a bit of a note on her positioning as well. From front on, it can look like she's resting on the hand as though she's posing for the camera. But from behind, you can see her flying through the action as intended. If the rear leg was used as a sole support, then the front leg would be free of the hand and really accentuate some of that action I think they were going for. Yep. Um, I still think it's a beautiful piece, but I recommend displaying it more on an angle. Uh, see, it's an eye for detail. It's how we do. It's what we do. And how. We are here once again with our resident TV expert, Jill. Thanks yes. for joining us. Hi. Today we are going to be talking about iZombie, uh, which is now in its second season. Yes. Yes, uh, about ten episodes in, I believe. That's right. Uh, now, for those who are unfamiliar, uh, you may have guessed already, it's about zombies. <laughs> um, there's a doctor, her name is Liv Moore. Obvious puns <laughs> littered through this show. Yeah. Uh, she ends up becoming a zombie after getting bitten at a party. Uh, she then has to become a coroner for the mm. easy access to brains yep. um, and then starts actually using her new zombie abilities to solve crimes 
hilarity ensues. Now, Jill, <laughs> did you like this one? What did you think? Yeah, I love iZombie. I think it's fun. Um, mm -hmm. I'm giving it a buy straight out. Great. Um, iZombie is like a police procedural, but with a twist. Mm -hmm. Like it's your Monster of the Week show with your protagonist as the monster. Yeah. And it, it's just, it's really clever in the way that it deviates from a normal cop show. You've got your main protagonist trying to solve crimes with the aid of the brains that she's consuming. Yeah. Taking on the personalities and memories of the victims. Yeah, which is a, it's a very interesting twist. Yeah. I mean, that concept where there's somebody who comes in and mm -hmm. they have some sort of ability or backstory or some tattoo or something that, need, yeah, that yeah. leads them to be useful <laughs> to the police. Mm -hmm. But this is a really, it's solid the way that this is it put is. forward because yeah. she just puts herself forward as being a psychic. And yeah, rather than yeah. going, yeah, no, I eat brains. <laughs> I don't think the cops would have been okay with that, even if no, they are dead at the time. So. Mm. Um, but that's, yeah, it is a really interesting twist on that. Just it bring is, it in, yeah. 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 And um, what did you think about the performances in this one? I think uh, all the actors are really solid. Mm. Like they, they nail their deliveries. Everything is consistent. Uh, the, there's no stale performances. Everyone's great. Yeah, there, yeah. there is a lot of charisma in the cast, I think. Yes. Um, um, even in the bad of, guys, they're hard not to love at least <laughs> a, a little bit. There's a lot of personality in them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody's instantly likeable, even the mm -hmm. people you really shouldn't be liking. That's which true. is a hard thing to handle, but it, it works. Yeah. It really yeah. works in this. Um, and you, you've been watching the second season. I have, yeah? yes. I only got a couple of episodes in the second mm -hmm. season. I, I really enjoyed the first season. Yeah. I will say I'm giving this one a, uh, a borrow okay. for myself yeah. because I did really enjoy the first season, mm -hmm. got into the second season and felt like it wasn't building on, I, on what it had achieved in the first yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. The first season they really set out with what they wanted to accomplish mm -hmm. and the season finale was insane and it made you want to come back for that second season yeah. but unfortunately i'm 10 episodes in and it's still a little same same yeah. i feel like they're probably stretching this out so they can reach a third season and have a, another story point oh, okay to go so it's from. sort of a filler season yeah there's a couple of little plot lines that they're covering at the moment but all in all i think they're trying to reach that third season so they can kick in a new storyline okay yeah. well hopefully people will follow it through to yeah. that to that next yeah. thing i think certainly they should have built up enough goodwill in the first season yes. that people have faith in them to uh, to yeah, get well, I, where they need to go? I haven't seen a bad episode yet. It mm. hasn't made me want to stop. Yeah. I, yeah. Well, I mean, I'm I think that's there. that was the thing. <laughs> it wasn't that there was a drop in quality. It just mm -hmm. felt like they were just back to business as usual, yes. and I felt like they needed to take it in a different direction. So yeah. we'll see where it goes. Um, I still think it's a very entertaining, very fun it's show. It's definitely worth watching. Yeah. So, I mean, definitely worth checking out. Mm -hmm. And, um, yeah, check out season two if you haven't already. Change often happens very slowly, sometimes so slowly we barely notice it. But there's always a point in the middle of it all. There's a point of no return, the crossing of the Rubicon, the tipping point. The Tipping Point is a new anthology from humanoids, collecting the work of creators from all over the world, all of them focusing on the moment when everything changes. Whether it's an alien invasion, a spiritual conversion, or the moment when you realise the internet has been telling you the truth about everything. The variety of styles shown here are only outdone by the weirdness of each story, but oh, such a wonderful weirdness. Now, as this is an anthology, we mm. cannot talk about every single story. <sighs> so many wonderful ones, but yeah. we've just kind of decided to choose two of our favourites and give you a bit of a snapshot on those ones. So, Al, what did you think of the anthology as a whole, and what are your two favourites? Okay, well, first off, yeah, I'm definitely giving this one a buy. Nice. Uh, it's a lovely collection by a lot of fantastic <laughs> creators. So good. Uh, like, some really amazing work on display here. Yeah. But, since I have to restrict myself restrict. to two. Uh, <laughs> now, first of all, there is Solo Mission by Naoki Urasawa. Mm -hmm. uh, now, this is a lovely little piece of work. It's mm -hmm. uh, It's got a nice comedic tone to it. It's got superhero tropes yep. mashed together with domesticity. Um, <laughs> just a couple talking about, you know, he, he has to go off on his superhero mission. She's like, you didn't tell me. He's like, yeah, you would have complained if I told you. <laughs> It's a lovely little slice of life moment yeah. with, a, with a nice little twist at the end, uh, which I greatly enjoyed. Mm. The visuals are great, so colourful and warm. It is and a really warm one, that one, yeah. yeah. So I really, really desperately loved one, that one. <laughs> that was a really nice little piece of work and um, not something I expected yep. from this, uh, especially with some of the darker stuff. 
It is one of the darker ones that I picked as my second, though. Oh, yes. Um, one that I found was really, honestly, very disturbing. <laughs> I read it three times just to go back over the shudder <laughs> moment. The Child by Sebastian Vives. Yeah, now, yeah, yeah. Yeah, you know what I'm talking yeah. about. Now, this <laughs> one is all done in black and white. Mm. It's quite minimalist in how the art style is used, yep. uh, but that really works. There's such an economy to how this story is told. Absolutely. Um, it does. I don't think it does a, a really intricate page until the final panel. Yeah. Um, and it's this. It is quite disturbing. I will say this is not one for kids because this one. This one gave me nightmares. Yeah, no, it's, it's terrifying. It's only about a three or four page story. That's still enough. Still gave me nightmares. <laughs> um, I. I don't even want to spoil anything about no. what it's about, other than something's gone down. Uh, the world is in peril, and there's two guys out, or two people out checking it out. Yep. And stuff. And it's terrifying. Goes down. Yep. Um, so it's <laughs> such a wonderful anthology, this one. That's yep. just two. I could go on at length, but I'm not allowed to. <laughs> um, there wasn't really a dull note for me here, though. No. What, what did you think? Well, look, I really loved it as well. It's definitely a buy from me. I love anthologies because you mm. do get to see so many wonderful artists doing their thing, telling their stories, creating these wonderful worlds in such short periods of time, yeah. which is wonderful. And th the thing is, if there is a story that you don't like, well, you can flick across and get to the next one. It's mm. all good. And there's so many different art styles from the, you know, the black and white simplistic one to the, the very final one, which is this crazy psychedelic... I, I can't even talk about that one. So I'll just talk about the two that I love the most. Mm. <laughs> so I really loved Consort to the Destroyer, which is uh, by Paul Pope. Sure. I've been a big fan of Paul Pope's for a long time and mm. oh, does not disappoint. The artwork in this is almost hypnotic. And... Very, very few words, mm. repeated, uh, repeated words, sure. which is really interesting. Um, yeah, and even repeated by a shark. By a shark, At one yep. point, which is interesting and but does I loved, sort of underlie the whole message of the piece. Yeah, and I loved that. That's mm. the thing. This is kind of, it's a comment on sexism, really. Yeah. Done in such an interesting way, almost a Conan the Barbarian Absolutely, kind of style. Absolutely, which I think is what it's riffing on, yeah. And, you know, you've got this this woman who just breaks free of her shackles, quite literally, mm -hmm. and she's the daughter of the mountain. That is what she is and that is who she will be. And it is absolutely beautiful to look through. And it yeah. was one that I read and went, oh, Paul Pope's art, love it, love it, love it, flick, 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 flick. I think I'll just go back and read that one again. And yeah. I read it probably four times mm. because it, it... It is a rereader. It's a rereader, yeah. even though it's very simplistic in its, in its language. Yeah, oh. it's quite short. It's, yeah. So good. And the other one I loved, which is kind of at the other spectrum, mm. um, is Emmanuel Lepage's The Awakening. Oh, ah, yes. So this is oh, such a delicate story, but quite a brutal story even still. The... It's the story of sexual awakening and the beginnings of creating your own sexual identity. Mm. The art style throughout most of it is in this beautiful, you know, black and white pencil with just a, a really slight touches of colour here and there until you do reach that tipping point and then mm. it explodes in colour. Yeah. And I think that's kind of something that goes through all of these stories is that when you get to that point, when you get to that moment, whether it's a tiny, tiny little thing or this big understanding of the world, it just flashes into your brain in yeah. this beautiful, bombastic colour well, and movement. The creators have really well um, latched into the concept they've been given. Yep. I mean, we've read anthologies that have been about time travel mm. or this or that, you know, sea voyages, whatever. Yep. This one, it's got such a simple but such an open concept. Absolutely. With the tipping point, the yep. moment everything changes. And they've taken it in so many different and fascinating so, ways. You know, there's racism, there's sexism, there's yeah, sexual identity, there's... Which Awakening is, is great Awakening is yeah. wonderful for that. Um, Huckleberry friend is a great story on racism on the mm. on the kind of the decision and, yeah, of moral sort of mor ambiguity. morality yeah. yeah which is really cool mm. look honestly well, again we, we could go on on and on and on <laughs> this is such a wonderful anthology to to grab your hands on it's just so many wonderful artists from all across the world which is what i love to see all mm. the different styles humanoids they've done it again it's amazing <laughs> get your hands on it uh, the tipping point it's the one you want That's all the time we have, guys. Thanks for joining us for our very first episode of 2016. Yes, from the Deadpool and Suicide Squad movies to season two of Agent Carter and Daredevil to the constant dizzying array of new <laughs> comics coming out. There is so much to look forward to this year. There is. So why don't you jump onto Facebook or Twitter and let us know what you're looking forward to the most in 2016. And until next time, guys. Bye. Bye. Duh, comfy pants. No. So comfy. Yeah.